Good morning, folks. Great to see you out this morning. Great to hear the buzz of conversation um, as we gather to worship and worship on a very special day. Today is Palm Sunday, the day we remember the king entering Jerusalem all those years ago. And that will be uh, sort of the theme of some of our songs and and our prayers this morning as we, we remember the king. A few announcements, evening worship tonight at uh, 6.30. And again, we're continuing the wee series we've been doing over the past few nights we've met, uh, looking at the servant king. And this is the final part tonight uh, from John uh, chapter 13. If you want to read that, and be lovely to see more of you coming along uh, as we, we come to worship God and think about uh, what happened in that upper room on the night when Jesus was betrayed, uh, what he did, uh, what he taught his disciples, and what he teaches us as all these generations later. So please, 6.30 tonight, you'd be more than welcome with a cup of tea afterwards. This week is starting our, our Easter teaching week. We had a fantastic time last year uh, down at 2nd when Stafford Carson led us through the week, uh, focusing upon Easter, and, and we thought we would do it again. There was such a, a, an enthusiasm for it last year. And so this year we're meeting down at St. Patrick's, all week, 8 o'clock each night, Monday through to Friday. Uh, as you see there, uh, on, and on your screen, the first three nights, Gilbert Lennox will be coming to speak. Gilbert has spoken at New Horizon uh, and Keswick and, and such events and, uh, and, and various other places around the world. And he's a lovely, lovely guy, and, and he's, he's looking forward to coming down. And then Thursday, we're going to do a Tenebrae service. I'm not going to go into all the explanation here, but you see it. Uh, I'll print out a little bit there to try and explain what a Tenebrae is, in case you think it's a weird Church of Ireland thing, or, 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 or even worse, it's not. Actually, the Reformers would have celebrated a Tenebrae service. Uh, and there's a little quote just to prove that. that it's from the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship. Um, how can I put it? It's a bit of a carol service, in a sense. It's readings, and it's Easter hymns, um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a service of shadows, is the way it puts. So each, at each point, a light goes out, a candle is extinguished, so the place gets darker and darker as we move closer and closer to the, the scripture readings of, about Good Friday and the darkness that came over Calvary. It's a very emotive, it can be a very emotional service if you come with the right attitude, as we should every service, to come to worship God and to seek God, and God can really speak through it. So don't be put off by that, please come. And uh, if that is enough for you, Friday will finish you off, because I got the short straw and preaching on Friday night. Uh, so if you're going away for the weekend, go Friday afternoon, and you'll not miss much. Um, but they're retiring often for E3, and there's a book stall if you're looking some. Easter gifts for people instead of buying them chocolate, buying them something that will will do them good, buy them a, a good book there. And then next Sunday is uh, Easter, Easter Sunday, the Resurrection Day, looking forward to that. Well, sort of, 7 a.m., dawn service up at Slemish, and I've, I'm on the road for this year. Um, thankfully, that'll do me for about another seven or eight years. Uh, but sit up there, and then here at 11.30, our morning worship, we're doing a, a, a something a bit different. Power of Redemption is called. It's a service of music and meditations and reading, celebrating uh, the Easter story, the resurrection of Jesus, and there'll be a short, uh, short epilogue at the end of that. So really do come along. If you're not away for an Easter break, please, please be here uh, throughout this week and next Sunday morning. And then one just brief announcement. It's not on the sheet. Um, It was just given to me on the way in. And it's uh, a word of congratulations. We don't often do this, but we don't often have these sort of landmarks. Sammy and Liz Adams. What are you looking embarrassed, Sammy? I think you've done all right. You've stuck it for 60 years, haven't you? Is it today? 60 years today married, so congratulations to, to Sammy and Liz. You've, you've done remarkable and a great example for us all. No, I'm not going to make any cracks about that, but anyway. Listen, we're here to worship. Palm Sunday. And on that first Palm Sunday, as Jesus entered the city, as he wove his way down the trail on that donkey, heading into to the city, the place was heaven. It was packed with people on the street cheering and waving palm branches and all the rest of it. And they were saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus answered, I tell you, 
If these were silent, the very stones would cry out. There are many who are trying to silence the voice of the church today, but we are not going to allow them. We are going to stand and we are going to add our voices to the generations on that first, ago, long ago on that first Palm Sunday, and we are going to sing all creatures of our God and King. Lift up your voice and with us sing. Let us stand and sing to the King of glory. Let's bow in prayer. 
as we bow in prayer, we meditate upon the words of the Old Testament prophecy from Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Father Pam Sunday was not some random event. The Lord Jesus just didn't decide that this would be a, a nice way to come into the city. That he was tired, that he couldn't be bothered walking. And so he jumped on whatever animal he could find. Father, what happened that first Palm Sunday was foretold centuries before. It was all part of your great plan of salvation. That the king, the king of kings and the lord of lords would come into that holy city in a way totally unexpected. Instead of on a great charge or, 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 or being brought in in, in, a, in a great cavalcade of military might, he comes in on a lowly donkey. Animals that were used as beasts of burden just to carry goods from here to there and back again. And yet the crowd still lined the streets and worshipped. They never worried about that. They thought their king was coming to cast out the enemies, to overthrow the Roman occupation, to reestablish that throne of David within the city of Jerusalem, to secure the borders of that land, and to once again set it free and make it prosperous. How we know that soon changed within a matter of days when that is not what happened. And your son continued to proclaim what your kingdom was like and what he had come to do. And the fickle crowd turned against him. Yet Lord, we fail to grasp an important lesson from how your son came. We are told he would come humbly, humbly, Lord. And we see that throughout his life, and we see that, Lord, in the last week of his life on this earth. Even as we return to it tonight, Lord, to see his humility, the one who created all things, humbly but kneeling down to wash his disciples' feet. But even greater than that, Lord, to humbly lay down his life to redeem a people for himself, a people who rejected him, a people who had replaced you with the idols. And yet he came humbly and faithful to your calling upon his life, walking in perfect obedience no matter the cost that lay before him. Father, help us look to that. That humble example that he set and help us, Lord, to, to live lives of selfless love. To walk the way you would lead us, even though it is costly, even though it requires sacrifice. The laying aside of our own ambitions and hopes and desires so we will bring you glory. Help us to take up our cross and follow after him. I mean, oh Lord, from your word, the great promises that you have made. And we see them fulfilled in your son Jesus because when he came humbly upon a donkey, while he humbly laid his life down upon the cross, you raised him from the tomb, which we will be celebrating next Sunday. 
but Lord, even greater than that, you, we are told that he, is no, he was raised to glory. Or we read in your word that you raised from him from the dead and seated him at your right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. And he put all things under, you put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church. Lord, you exalted him. He reigns over all. All things are under his authority. And Father, for those who follow him, for those, for those who, who kneel before him and humbly worship him, Lord, you will exalt to the highest place as well. You will, you will make us co-heirs with him. We will be in glory with him. Lord, oh, what a reward. How could we look for anything else in life except what you have promised those who follow the king? So Lord, in this Palm Sunday, just let us celebrate that great event. But let us remember the example that your son set. And let us surrender to his lordship and follow him. And we ask us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Boys and girls, you want to come to the front? Some of you, right? It's great. Come on ahead. Who likes Easter? Okay. Why? I'll start with this in. Why do you like Easter? What's your favorite bit? Easter eggs. Are you hoping to get some next week? Are you? What's your favorite? Anything as long as it's chocolate. That's fair enough. Jesus died on the cross. Do you like uh, Jesus died on the cross? That's a great, great thing about Easter. That is why we celebrate the most important thing. Pam Sunday, you like today, do you? You hear all about it? The Easter Bunny comes. Easter Bunny comes. Why do you look over there? Which I'll be a sight I would love to see. Which one of you dress up as an Easter Bunny? <laughs> do you know what you haven't said? And this is really, really, really surprising. You're off school. Hey, you want to say that? Anna? You're off school. Well, some schools are very good. There are kids and they've finished already. Some schools aren't. Yeah, saying nothing, I know. But listen, Easter as well. Yeah, Easter's a great time, and you know that I love Easter. I get very excited about Easter. Uh, I definitely don't need any, any Easter eggs because I'm starting to look like one, um, taking that shape. But I love Easter. I'm really, really excited about this week. Uh, and I know it'll be a bit late for you, but I hope lots of other folks come out to the, this special week of, of, of Bible study uh, down in St. Patrick's. Very excited about it. But Easter is a great time of the year. I'm going to tell you a story about Easter and it's a wee bit different. Uh, this one's a little bit different. It's not the way you normally hear it, but I want you to listen carefully and I want you to think about the things you hear in this story. It's a story about two donkeys and one of them is called Dave. So sit back, look at the pictures and listen to what we have to say. Dave, the donkey, was so excited. He'd been watching all week for Grandpa Donkey to get back from Jerusalem. Dave had some big news he'd been waiting to share with him. Grandpa, Grandpa, guess what? I carried the king into Jerusalem. You're joking, Dave. No, Grandpa, I carried the king. I was standing out the front minding my own business when the king's servant untied me and led me to the king. The king jumped on my back and, and we charged down the hill and up the mountain to Jerusalem. The crowd waved palm branches and everybody cheered, hooray for the king, long live the king. We said goodbye and I headed home leaving the king to get on with the job of being king. So grandpa, You've been in Jerusalem since then. Tell me what happened next. Did the crowd keep cheering for the king? Well, Dave, 
The crowd were yelling for the king. Wow, said David, and I'm sure all the leaders came to meet him. Yes, sighed Grandpa. The king did meet all the leaders. And Grandpa, they would have placed a golden crown upon the king's head. They certainly crowned the king, but it wasn't made of gold. The throne, Grandpa, they must have led the king into the palace, sat him on the throne and cheered, long live the king. No, Dave, sighed Grandpa. There was no throne. They led the king out of Jerusalem and they nailed him to a cross. Dave was stunned. A, cr- a cross? So, so, so the king is dead? No, Dave. The king was dead. The king was placed in a tomb and the tomb was sealed with a heavy stone. But now the king is alive. He was dead, but the tomb is empty and the king is alive. Dave stared across the valley to Jerusalem as the strange and wonderful news ruled out through his through, ruled through his mind. The king was dead, but now he's alive. Grandpa asked Dave, "Did you ever carry someone special that you will never forget?" "Yes, Dave," said Grandpa. "As a matter of fact, I did. It was long ago on a starry night like this." I carried someone special that I will never forget. Long live the king, Dave. Long live the king. Who was the king? Jesus. Jesus was the king. And that's the amazing thing. As I was saying in my opening prayer, when when Jesus came into Jerusalem, people thought he was going to be the great king who would do amazing things, who would who who would sit like King Charles on a throne, have a big crown on his head, and uh, and be able to do amazing things for all the people. But that's not the type of king Jesus came to be. And that's why the crowds turned against him. That's why the crowds stopped cheering and started jeering and said to Pilate, "Crucify him." Because he wasn't the king that they wanted him to be. Jesus came to be a very different king. Jesus came in that donkey, not the way kings come. But he came in that donkey humbly because that's the type of king he came to be. He came to serve us. He came to serve us by laying down his life upon the cross for us. By being punished for all of our sin, all the things that we do wrong against God. That's the type of king he came to be. But as we see in the story, Dave was, Dave was devastated when he heard that until Grandpa told him, no, listen, listen, Dave, the king's alive. Yes, he did die on the cross, but this is what happened. And that is the amazing thing about Easter. That is the, the really important thing about Easter. Jesus was raised from the tomb because he had lived the perfect life. He had not disobeyed God in any way. And so when he died upon the cross, God accepted what he did And raise him from the dead so that you and I, if we come to trust in Jesus, if we come to follow him, if we come and allow him to be our king and we walk in the way that he showed us, then one day we too will have that wonderful hope of eternal life. That's why Easter's so exciting. Yes, Grandpa, it's all a story, but Grandpa brought a woman to Bethlehem have a little baby who was born in a stable and we have a real good old hooli about that at Christmas but this is the most important part Jesus died Jesus rose again and Jesus is in heaven and one day he's coming back this time not as a baby not riding on a donkey but he's coming back as the great king and he will defeat the devil and destroy all evil And those who trust in him will live in his kingdom, his perfect kingdom forevermore. That's why Easter is so exciting. Remember that wonderful story. Let's pray for a moment and then we're going to sing. Father, thank you uh, for Easter. Thank you for all that Jesus did for us. And help us not to forget that. Help us to forget that when he went to the cross, that's exactly why he was born in Bethlehem. He came from heaven and came to earth to go to the cross, to be punished for guilty people like us. But he rose again. 
He defeated the enemy. He is alive. And we know because of that, all of us who trust in him will one day live forevermore in your presence, in your wonderful and perfect kingdom. So Father, open our hearts and open our minds and allow Jesus to be king of our lives and let us share in his glory. And we ask us in his name. Amen. We're going to sing. We're going to stand and sing. And we're going to sing this. Jesus is the name we honor. And that is why, if we are Christian, we, what we should be doing, we should be telling people all about Jesus, about his death and his resurrection, and the fact that he is king forevermore. Let's stand and we'll sing this one together. job as I said over the last few Sunday nights we've been gathering we've been we've been looking at, at Jesus washing the disciples feet in, in the upper room uh, looking at that passage in in John chapter 13. This morning I want to go back a couple of chapters, I'll go back to chapter 11 in the same gospel uh, and verse 45 through to uh, 57. Uh, this is after Jesus had entered into uh, Jerusalem and the great, uh, that big triumphant entry and all that was going on. Oh, sorry, it's just before it, I should say. Uh, just before it. Uh, and this was a, a turning point, a turning point in, in what was going to happen to Jesus in the coming days. This is uh, John chapter 11, verses 45 through to 57, the word of God to us today. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, that is the raising of Lazarus, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was, a high, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. 
He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Jesus therefore no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness, to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. Amen. And we thank God for his word. I mean, we bless us the reading of his uh, truth. We're going to turn and uh, pray for others at this time. And as we do so, it is with regret that I have the to announce the death on Wednesday past of Mr. William Elliott of Three Winsmore Avenue. A funeral service was held yesterday in Stevenson's funeral home in Ballymena and moving across then to Connor's Cemetery for the Camille. We remember his wife Annie, the sons Andrew and Mark and the wider family circle in prayer. Let us bow before God in prayer. Father, we know that um, all sorts of experiences will come across our path in life. None more traumatic than the loss of a loved one. And Father, we do think of the Elliot family uh, this morning. We pray for Annie in particular. Lord, as she mourns the, the, the loss of her beloved husband and the quietness that will then now envelop her her home just down the road. Father, we know she's been used to um, William being away in in hospital for a long time now, but now the certainty of the fact is that he will not be home again. Father, we pray for her and pray for your comfort, your compassion, your peace and your love to, to come upon her and for the wonderful memories of the many years that they share to, to uh, Lord, bring some joy to her heart. Pray for Andrew and Mark and, uh, and their uh, spouses and, and children. And for all the brothers and sisters, William's brothers and sisters, Lord, who, um, who gather to remember and to mourn. We pray for your hand to be upon them, that they would seek you, and know you as their God, as their Saviour, and as their great hope. Father, we thank you that in recent weeks, William was open to discussing about you and the need to be ready for when the time, our time on earth came to an end. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for the peace he had, and we, we do trust in your mercy and grace, Lord, that you have taken him unto yourself. So, Lord, come. Uh, and, and, and be with that family and comfort them, we pray. I Father, we think of others within our, our own families or maybe neighbours, work colleagues, and, and certainly within this congregation who are, who are struggling at the minute. We know we have a number who are, are sick, awaiting treatment, going through treatment, recovering. Some not sure what the future holds, uh, Lord, with their conditions. Again, we pray for them, Lord, to to know that wonderful truth that your grace is sufficient for all their needs. Hard to cling on to when life is tough. But Father, may they know that supernatural peace that comes from your spirit resting upon them. And for families who are caring for, for sick or frail or elderly, Lord, we pray for, for great strength that they will need, both of body, mind, and soul. We pray, Lord, that they will be surrounded with family and friends and and the family of this church to help them in the days that lie ahead, help them in all that they have to do, to remember them in prayer, but Father, that we would also help practically, whatever way we can do to help ease their, their busy, busy lives, Lord, and to make things just a little bit more comfortable for them. 
And Father, for this week coming up, we thank you for Easter week, Lord. We've been thinking about sickness and we've been praying for those who have uh, suffered bereavement. But this week is the, the week we remember of the great hope that we have. That death is not the end. That Christ has overcome it. And all who trust in him have been given the promise of eternal life. Will there be no more sorrow or suffering or pain or illness or any of those horrible things that blight our walk through this earth? And so, Lord, as we gather this week, as we gather down in St. Patrick's with, with others from across this village and district, Father, may our hearts be open to the wonderful truth of salvation through the death and resurrection and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we, we grasp afresh this wonderful Easter story and the wonderful hope that we have because of it. May it uh, strengthen us. May it encourage us. May it restore the joy of your salvation into our hearts and souls. And may our unity, may our coming together, Lord, in this village, be an, a witness and an example, a testimony to, to the wider community that, yes, we have our separate buildings. We, we, we do different bits and pieces and do it in different styles, but we are one under the Lordship of Christ. And it's his name we honor. It is his name we worship. It is to him that we bow our heads or our knees and give all glory to. So Father, be with us in the week ahead. Lord, come and strengthen your people, build your church, and bring glory unto your name. And all these things we ask and pray in the name of Jesus, the risen Savior, seated at your right hand. Amen. Amen. When we gather, we gather to worship. And, and worship is about giving to the Lord. It's not about what we get, it's what we, about what we give. And one way we, we worship the Lord is by giving off our, our, our finances, um, a fitting proportion of them for the work of the Lord. And another way to worship is sing. We obviously sing. One version of Psalm 100 puts it like this. O enter then his gates with praise, approach with joy his courts unto Praise Lord and bless his name always, for it is seemingly so to do. As we present our offerings, we will remain seated, and we'll sing all people that on earth do dwell. Yeah. Hey.
Almighty God, we worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We lift our voices to praise you. We have given our finances, Lord, to support and encourage the work of your kingdom. But Father, our ultimate act of worship and praise is to submit to the authority of your word. And so, Lord, now as we come to meditate upon this uh, passage of scripture that we read together of this uh, pivotal moment in, in, the, in the last days of your son's life Father teach us teach us what we need to hear and by your spirit give us the humility to confess our sin and to submit to walking in obedience to your commands Sovereign God, come, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. When you've got your Bibles open, you'll follow with us as we work through this passage in John uh, chapter 11, verse 45 and 3. And as you're, you're doing that, I'm going to ask uh, you to think about it. Here's a wee bit of a challenge. See if you can give me the answer of what have all these various pictures got in common? What have they all got in common? Quite a eclectic range there. Anybody? Sorry? Yeah, you're right. Thomas, yeah, they like them or you don't like them. They're all very divisive type of things. You either love them or you hate them. Look at fact, I mean, I'm not getting into Brexit. Thank you, I was on the other side of the border when that happened and didn't have a say in it. Um, Donald Trump, well... Do I need to go any further uh, on him? Incredibly divisive. Um, Man United, well, sure, most of us hate them. Uh, and Brussels sprouts, well, that causes rise in homes, doesn't it? You know, when sadly, Strictly Come Dancing divides our house massively. Of course, the ultimate is Marmite. You either love it or hate it, don't you? They're divisive issues. People have different opinions on them. Maybe some you're indifferent to. I mean, you can't be bothered about football. Who cares about it? It's a waste of time. But say, people like Donald Trump in particular, one of the most divisive characters in, in modern history. Generally, there's no middle ground. People say, ah, whatever. And I say, well, you have to say he's an absolute lunatic or, or else you think he's the greatest thing ever to become president. It's love or hate, isn't it? In our reading this morning, we see that sort of division. In that passage, in, in John chapter 11, we very clearly see that, that, that Jesus was a divisive character. People either loved or hated him. There, there were different reactions to him when, he, when he, he walked in this earth, and there were different reactions to him uh, centuries later. So just before that passage which we read together was, was the raising of, of Lazarus from the dead. And as a result of of that incredible miracle, we read in in verse 45 of of John 11, that many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. They believed because of all that they had seen and all that they had heard Jesus do during his ministry, especially this raising of Lazarus. Remember, Lazarus had been dead for, for a few days. Uh, 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 and in the heat of, of that Middle Eastern country, even though he was in a tomb, it wouldn't have been the most pleasant of thing to rule the stone away. And yet Jesus comes, he gets people to do that, and he simply says, Lazarus, come out. 
And my goodness, Lazarus appears fit and healthy. Many believed. Many believed because they'd never seen this before. Uh, many believed because they thought, well, this is no ordinary man. There's only one, one person who has power over life and death, and that's the Lord himself. So this must be the Messiah. This must be God. The one God's promised. They saw what he did, and they believed. And in many ways, folks, we are even more privileged because while we didn't see that event, we have this. We have the whole canon of Scripture. We have the whole Word of God that shows right from the very first pages of who the Messiah would be and what he would be like and what he would come to do. And then we have the story of Christ on earth and then we have the story of the early church and the story of what will happen when Christ returns. We have the whole story here before us. And Jesus said himself to those disciples, later on to the disciples in John 20, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We are an incredibly privileged people. We are incredibly blessed according to the words of Jesus because we didn't see things, but we still believe because of all that we have heard through the word of God. Friends, we have overwhelming evidence for the claims that Christ made. We have overwhelming evidence for the claim of the early church that there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And friends, it's to those who believe and accept that truth. Who believe that Jesus was the Messiah, he was the promised one of Scripture, and those who believe that he is Lord and Savior, that he gives salvation to, and he gives the promise of eternal life. We have incredible evidence. Many believe, but many don't. People saw the raising of Lazarus and many believed, but not everybody did. In the next verse we read that, well, verse 45 says many believe, but then in verse 46 we read some of them, some of the ones who saw what had gone on, went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Why? Why? We don't know. We don't know why they went off to tell the Pharisees. Uh, as we read through it, we, we do get a picture that these men, these people themselves didn't believe, uh, but they went away and to, sh to spread this news and tell the priests and the Pharisees. But what we do know is how the, 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 the religious leaders reacted to it. It says uh, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council. That is the, the Sanhedrin. That was, that was the, the overarching body of, of, of Jewish rel religious leadership. They were the, the final authority. And they said this in, in, in verses 47 to 48. What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. That's an incredible reaction from the Pharisees and the scribes and so on. Because these were the religious elite. This was the religious elite of the, the nation. These were the men who knew the scriptures inside and out. They could quote any part of it. And they could explain it. If you wanted to understand scripture, they were the people you went to. And asked, well, what does this mean and how does that apply to me? These were the religious elite. These were the men that many people aspired to be like. They were seen as being holy and wise and knowledgeable. And they gathered together on this news that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. And no doubt being a religious leaders and a spiritual people, they began with, with prayer. I mean, that's what church leaders do when they gather. But when they gathered, this wasn't a meeting to discuss how Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament. How Jesus fulfilled all that was said about the coming Messiah. In fact, this meeting did the exact opposite. This meeting was to discuss how to get rid of him. 
Because this one was a troublemaker in their eyes. This one uh, was, was a threat to them having control over the people. Holding their seats of authority within the nation. And not only that, but they were worried. They were worried that the crowds that were turning to follow Jesus could cause a rebellion, a religious rebellion, turn against the Pharisees and so on. This could upset the stability of the nation that existed under the, in the land under Roman rule. They were afraid that the Romans would respond and take complete control. Isn't it ironic, or maybe it's just me, that those who were most opposed to Jesus and his claims were the religious elite? The spiritual people, the theologians of the day, not the sinners and the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the drunkards and the swindlers, but the good, upright, religious people of the day. People like you and me. And you know, it has been the case in our church. For many, many years in the past, our denomination were, was led by men who, who uh, were called to teach the scriptures, teach the truth about Jesus and salvation, but they failed to do so. Even though they knew the scriptures, they were well grounded in them, they could quote them, they could debate about them, but they failed to preach the truth. I remember hearing one man, uh, he's long, long dead and gone, he was a minister, and um, Oh, the church was well. The church is almost dead now. As well, he would never preach the gospel, never preach the need for salvation. And somebody said to me one day, "You know, when he started, he was a firebrand for the gospel. But why did he turn? That well, was the pressure from the people in the pews. They put him under so much pressure to stop preaching the truth of God's word that he did." They didn't, he didn't want to upset the people. He didn't want them to, the, the leadership didn't want the, the congregation to vote with their feet and walk away and thus make the, the position of the minister vulnerable in the, in the future of the congregation. But thankfully, we're generally past those dark days. Generally, and it still exists. There are those who are unhappy who have been challenged with the claims of Christ and, and, and various things are still happening. Our denomination has never been busier with uh, presbytery inquiries and judicial, uh, meet, judicial meetings in church house of fallouts within congregations and quite often it's to do with the preaching of the truth. They want to hear nice stories about feeling good about themselves. There have been rows over our, our church's stance on, on, on membership of the church and on the sacraments according, we teach according to the Bible and people have not reacted kindly to that and they've voted with their feet and of course some places it's the pressure has brought the bear and the preachers to water down the message as it was in the past and we thank God for strong men who are not bound to such intimidation but life is incredibly difficult for them in their churches and what is happening is that ministers are then up and leaving and moving somewhere else or sadly leaving the ministry altogether due to stress. And I've had some friends who I went through college with that has happened to. Some do bend for a quiet life and to keep their job, sadly. What is the problem if we respond in the way the Pharisees did and we reject and we oppose the claims of Christ? Well, I like this, we quote. That's... There we go. When a church is driven by member preference, it is headed toward decline, then death. The decline may be protracted and the death may be delayed, but it is inevitable. If we start doing things to please punters in the pews and we neglect the word of God, then I could take you a number of congregations that don't exist anymore because of that. As I've said before, and I'll probably say again, if you want entertainment, go down to the opera house. If 
you're hungry for the word of God, to know God, to walk in God's way, to live and to serve God, this is the place to be. If you want entertainment, you want to hear nice things to make you feel good about yourself, this is the future. This is the future. And that's what happened to the Jews. They rejected Jesus. They didn't want to hear what he had to say. And within a very short space of time, Jerusalem was ransacked by the Romans. The temple was destroyed and the Jews were driven out. The nation ceased to exist. They didn't want Jesus. And in fact, it's funny, the, the various groups within this, religion, this Jewish council were actually enemies of each other. They hated each other, and yet when they found a common enemy, they came together. Because Jesus was a threat to, to, to their little personal empires, their kingdoms were, that had been built on privilege and prestige and money and power. He, he threatened all those things to take them away from them. And they didn't, didn't want that to happen. And as one writer said, God and scripture did not figure at all in their reasoning. There was no appeal to truth, no evidence of spiritual commitment to the the God of their fathers, but only policy and politics, power and position. That's what the religious leaders wanted. But that's not what Jesus came to bring. He had spent three years, three years walking this earth with his his little group of disciples following him all over the countryside, demanding and preaching about total commitment to him as Savior and to God as their Father. Total commitment to, to the Word of God and walking in the ways of God. Of putting Christ first and ourselves last. Listen to a couple of passages from Luke and the words of Jesus. Luke 9, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it and whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? And then Luke 14, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. He ever does not bear his own cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. And what it means by hate there is to put in second place. We put God first and all of his claims and everything else, even our own lives, come secondary. Folks, these men, these religious leaders knew the scriptures. They knew what God demanded right through the Old Testament scriptures. But they were not prepared to apply it to their lives because it would cost them too much. They would have to sacrifice their positions of prestige and power and authority and wealth. You know, there are many people like that who like the idea of of having Jesus as saviour. Yeah, it's nice. I know God forgives my sins and, and, and he's promised me a place in eternal life and I'm thankful for that and then they just go and live life the way they used to. But they don't like the idea of Jesus being Lord. Well, they have to submit to his authority, to his teaching and do things his way, not their way. But friends, when it comes to salvation, you can't have one without the other. It's either all or nothing with Jesus. There's no sitting on the fence. There's no being indifferent as, as, as the people at the end of that passage were, you know, they, they said, do you think Jesus will show up? Do you, think, do you think he'll come? Who knows? They weren't really interested in one way. They were just looking to show to see a fight between Jesus and the religious leaders. Friends, when it comes to Jesus If we want to accept him as saviour, we have to submit to him as Lord. We have to submit to the whole counsel of God. And what do I mean by the whole counsel of God? Well, it means that we don't just pick a few select verses that we like and that make us feel good and try and say, yeah, I I believe in Jesus as my saviour and that's it. 
when we preach, when we talk about submitting to the whole counsel of God, submitting to Christ as Lord, it means submitting to the whole of Scripture. Every aspect of Scripture, no matter how difficult and how challenging it is, no matter how, how costly it might be for us to submit to it. See, Paul said in Acts 20 and 27, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. And as one writer explains, he taught the burden of the whole of God's revelation, the balance of things, leaving nothing out that was of primary importance, never ducking the heart bits. He talked about God's purposes in the history of redemption, who God is and what sinful man is and uh, what it means to be redeemed. Uh, he spoke about the, the need of a savior, one that, that we need someone who would pay the penalty for our, our sin and, and we had to trust in him. And he spoke about how God's people should live, how they should conduct themselves, what God's commandments were for his people, for his church, and how we should obey them and live in our individual lives, how we should be transformed to become more like Jesus. That's what it means to submit to the Lordship of Christ. To look at the whole of Scripture and strive by the, the power of God's Spirit to live in humble obedience to it. To sacrifice our ambitions. And when the whole counsel of God is taught, it strikes home, it challenges, it shows the depth of our sin. It shows our need of a Savior. It shows who Christ is. It shows us the cost of following Christ, the sacrifices that need to to be made and we don't like that because we are a proud people we don't like to be told we are wrong we can't be, we don't like to be told that, that we can't live life the way we want to we don't like to be told that we cannot earn our salvation we we cannot be told that we don't like to be told that we need to change our our, our attitudes and our behaviors and our dare i say our personalities to conform to the image of jesus We don't like to be told. We don't like to be told. And we don't like to submit to someone else's authority over us. It's all or nothing, friends. That's what Jesus demands. No middle ground, no sitting on the fence, no one, one foot in one camp, one foot in the other. We can't have a pick and mix approach to following Jesus. You can't pick the nice bits and leave out the hard bits. When Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him take, deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's a call to sacrifice. That's a call to, to suffering for the sake of Christ. And today is Palm Sunday. The day when Jesus entered Jerusalem to the sound of the cheering crowds, that turned to jeers within a few days because he did not meet the expectations of many. And they would plot against him for the rest of that week to crucify him. And yet, others continued to trust. Even though they didn't understand what was going on, they, they still trusted in Jesus, who he said he was. And so in this week, the greatest week of the year, the greatest week in the, in the calendar of the church, I want to ask you this question. What will you do with Jesus? Will you continue to reject him? You'll still come here because it's what you do and it makes you feel good about yourself. But when it comes to what the word of God says, no, I'll just close my ears and not think it's up to preach it. That's rejecting him. That's hardening his heart, your heart's against the gospel. Will you try and sit in the fence saying, I like the idea of Jesus as Savior and my sins being forgiven and, and, and I'm all right that way, but I'm, listen, I'm not going to give up that part of my life for him. That's too important. I'm holding on to that. I'm not going to submit to everything he says. In John 11, Caiaphas, member of the ruling council, anti Jesus, he said to the, to the people, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He said he was thinking of Israel in the temple. He was thinking of his privileged position. 
But he prophesied that one man would die for the nation. But not only for the nation of Israel, but as John went on to say, also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Friends, will you, this Easter time, will you come and bow before the cross of Christ? Will you come and trust in him as the only way of salvation, the only way of forgiveness of sins, the only way of being received into the family of God? And also, and equally as important, will you submit to his authority? Will you surrender to him as king and lord? Will you surrender your ambitions, your hopes, and your plans into his hands? Let's stand and commit ourselves. to the king of ages immortal invisible the only god be honor and glory forever and ever and may the lord bless you and keep you may the lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you may the lord turn his face toward you 
and give you peace. Amen.